Thank you for joining us today. And today's topic is the sacraments and the vocation of holiness. And if you've been trying to count, okay, which sacraments have we covered, which have we not, we're sort of cheating today because we're sort of treating three sacraments today. Uh, we're treating the sacraments of holy orders and matrimony and of baptism. And of course, all of them deserve a lot more than what we can give today, but I want to make a basic point as we talk about those three sacraments. And that has to do with one of the most important things, one of the single most important things that was taught at the Second Vatican Council. Now, as you've heard me say in a few homilies here and there and talks, you know, there's Vatican II and there's Vatican II. There's Vatican II as it really is, the actual documents and teaching, and then you have uh, all the things that has got associated with Vatican II, sometimes called the spirit of Vatican II. Uh, and uh, and uh, you're off to the races with that. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, some people seem to think is that Vatican II really was all about power, who's in charge. In fact, George Weigel years ago, when he wrote about this, he said, he said for some people, the only thing that Vatican II was about was the discussion of who's in charge of things. And that sort of trickled down in all sorts of ways. It did all sorts of damage. Uh, I came across in our archives here a, uh, a sort of a, an, awful, an awful outline that was given out to people in ministry here. Uh, and uh, it was called T Top Ten Myths About Lay Ministry. Uh, and, uh, and basically it's propaganda, but it was an agenda that had all to do with let's sort of see you know, what the power structure here is in the parish. Uh, and there are, there are some people who think that the whole purpose of Vatican II was to give people that didn't used to be able to do something to do, something to do. You know, so the issue of like extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion became a huge deal. Huge deal. We've got to have as many people up there at the altar as possible. Because isn't this cool? We didn't used to be able to do this, now we can. Isn't this exciting and so forth? Well, I mean, we could go off and give a whole talk on that, but basically, extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion are meant to be extraordinary. And what happened was they became ordinary. Uh, and again, uh, I don't feel like getting into that discussion. Maybe you do. I need more than coffee. But, uh, the, uh, you know, how many exactly do you need? And what if, you know, we have to add to two whole minutes to Mass because we don't have any of extraordinary ministers? The point is this. That became, for many people, the issue of Vatican II. Isn't this cool? We get a lot more people doing what priests alone used to be able to do. Well, you could read all of the 16 documents of Vatican II and not find that mentioned anywhere, you know? It became the so-called spirit of Vatican II, in which all sorts of things got hooked onto Vatican II as if this is what it's all about. One of the most important things that Vatican II did teach hardly gets mentioned at all. In fact, all this other stuff is kind of a corruption of this beautiful, beautiful teaching. It's in the great dogmatic constitution on the church, sometimes known by its Latin name, Lumen Gentium, which means light to the nations, to the Gentiles, to the peoples. It's the dogmatic constitution of what is the church. Very, very important document. And what it says there in section 41 of Lumen Gentium is this, is that every baptized Catholic is called to holiness. Every baptized Catholic is called to holiness. It's come to be known as the universal call to holiness. That is, everyone who makes up the church, who's been joined to Christ through the sacrament of baptism, is called to holiness. And it goes on in that section to say some important things. One of the things it says, of course, is that it, we're called, all of us are called by baptism, to what, and this is a technical term, we're called to perfection. Now, we think of perfection as, you know, some gymnast in the Olympics scoring a perfect 10 and so forth. Perfection, as we all know, I hope we all know, is a church word to describe the calling that's always been associated with the so-called evangelical councils. Evangelical meaning Jesus gives us this direction through the Gospels that we read. If you would be perfect, he says to the rich young man, get rid of your money, sell it and so forth, and come and follow me. And so the evangelical councils, council means not so much like, uh, you know, we're going to form a parish council, but direction. It's a calling. It's a very interesting word. It's different than commandment. But the calling 
is to holiness, and it's always expressed in a threefold way that goes back to very early years of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And we could give a whole talk about how those came to be, but you can see them in different aspects of Jesus' calling. That he himself, you can see them, in fact, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the teaching of St. John in his epistle, of how we get free of possessions and, and all that would keep us from God. But let's note that over the course of history, what became known as the Evangelical Councils, they were associated with what we call religious life. That those who entered into religious life as brothers, as sisters, as nuns, that they were called to poverty, chastity, and obedience, and they expressed those in the form of vows. Some added other vows like stability and so forth, direct obedience to the Pope and things like that. Well, then there was a question for centuries of just what do those councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience have to do with priests, specifically diocesan priests, people like me. And oh, you used to have lots of jokes about that. You know, they used to say, they used to say, well, well, you know, religious order priests, they take the vow of poverty, but diocesan priests live the poverty, okay? What that means is this. Some religious orders, they might technically have no private possessions, but they had no private possessions. They lived on this 500-acre castle in which 12 meals a day were provided for them and everything else. So, uh, so who's made the poverty vow, okay? That of the diocesan priest who has to has to change his own light bulbs and so forth. So, so there's been questions there. And at a certain point, some of the diocesan priests began to say, well, maybe poverty, chastity, and obedience are not just for the religious. And woo, there was a great pushback on that, you know? And, uh, and you may not realize there's a lot of sparring back and forth between religious order priests and diocesan priests about who are the better ones, who is more important, who's got the higher calling, and so forth. Well, if that was fun, then things really busted open back in the 1950s when there began to be this notion that perhaps every Catholic, every baptized Catholic, is meant to live the evangelical counsels of poverty and chastity and obedience, obviously differently expressed according to their state of life. And uh, I mentioned last, night, uh, last week as a coming attraction, this was especially brought forward by a famous... Jesuit theologian named Father Jean Baer, <laughs> nice name, his name was spelled B-E-Y-E-R, he was from Belgium, but Father Jean Baer was an early one theologian who said, really, every Catholic is called to the councils, the evangelical councils, and oh, he got pushed back heavy and hard, his books were denounced, and he was forbidden to teach that, and so on and so forth, except that someone who read it thought he was a pretty good idea, and his name was Angelo Roncalli, <laughs> who a little later became Pope John the 23rd. And Pope John the 23rd was very intrigued by this notion that the evangelical councils are for everyone. And as the Second Vatican Council met and as the document on the church developed, Pope John the 23rd insisted that this reference be included, that the evangelical councils are for all the baptized, that there is a universal call to holiness. Now most of us have now gotten used to that idea. But believe it or not, what used to be said was this. The religious are called to holiness. The rest of us, uh, you know, pray, pay, and obey. You know, okay, see if you can kind of scratch your way into heaven somehow. That was, the, that was the reigning idea out there. And this was radical. This was radical. And of course, it remained radical as it was taught. You may recall that Pope John the 23rd, who saints today we celebrate today, he gave an enormously lengthy series of talks at his Wednesday papal audiences. They wound up becoming what's known as the theology of the body. And he talked about marriage, family, sexuality, and so forth. At a certain point, Pope John Paul II said, married people are called to chastity. And the whole world erupted in chuckles and derision and sarcasm. Like, uh, Holy Father, don't you, like, uh, don't you like understand how all this works and so forth, you know? They couldn't believe that a pope would say that married people are called to chastity. And we'll just take a very short uh, sidetrack here to remind us of what is continence, what is celibacy, and what is chastity. Okay, continence simply means you, uh, because we have children here, you don't do it. Okay, you might not do it because you can't do it. You might not do it because there's no one around to do it. You might not do it for all kinds of reasons. But continence is simply a physical a physical you know, absence 
from activity, sexual activity, and so forth. It might have nothing to do with spiritual, moral, or anything like that. When you talk about celibacy, you're talking about a specific promise or vow that someone takes. By nature, celibacy, when it's that way, it's not just temporary, okay, for the next couple months I'm going to be celibate until I find the right girl and so forth, you know. Uh, it's really a stronger, more vowed or promised notion. And again, not every state of life is called to be celibate, of course. And there are certain people who are called to this, but not everyone. And we could give a whole talk about that of great value, even for married people to learn. But celibacy and chastity are not the same thing. Chastity. Chastity is one of the three evangelical councils that is for every baptized Catholic, whatever your, quote, state of life. That means, of course, it's expressed differently. For the people like me who are celibate, of course, it's expressed in a certain way. With, oh, by the way, all sorts of follow-through. I've told some of you before that, you know. When you become a priest, you know, there's certain ways that chastity is key to your celibacy. And sadly, we look around and see a lot of priests who thought they could be celibate without being chaste. I know that sounds weird, but think about it. You know, a celibate priest, if he doesn't live chastely, what do I mean by that? Well, I've told you about this. When, you know, when a priest for decades were told, never travel alone with a woman, especially at night, unless she's old enough to be your mother. And I got into trouble at Nativity where I was because, uh, you know, I, uh, I had to take this woman back after a, a, a visitation. She was about 75 years old. And uh, she'd heard me talk about this. She said, well, I guess you're saying I'm a pretty old lady if you're willing to drive me home at night. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, yes. <laughs> Congratulations. You were 25. I would not be driving you around at night and so forth, you know. Uh, no, we were taught, is it okay to have uh, a meal with an individual woman as a priest? And the rule, these are called rules of propriety, is it's typically okay to have lunch with one woman, but it's not okay to have dinner with one woman. You might say, oh, isn't that silly? No, it's not silly. You know as well as I do, at five o'clock in the restaurants, they turn the lights down a bit. They light the candles at the tables. Lunch and dinner are two different things when you're out at a restaurant. If you don't know that, where have you been living and so forth, you know? So there's all sorts of uh, practices that we observe about how to be chaste as celibate priests. But you, as married people, you perhaps who are single people, every one of us is called to be chaste. It's the universal call of holiness. And the same is true for poverty. Once again, Pope John Paul, who wrote the magnificently on this. Please, don't go find him, Pope John Paul and the Evangelical Councils. He wrote in great detail about poverty. And he talked about how every one of us is called to express poverty somehow, some way. It's not just for those crazy Franciscans or who people over here are there. And again, if we had more time, maybe we'll give a three-part talk uh, in the spring on poverty, chastity, obedience, for people who aren't nuns or monks or brothers and sisters, because it's very important for all of us. Obedience, perhaps, is one of the most interesting ones of all. Oh, Pope John Paul wrote a lot about obedience in the life of people who have not made a vow of obedience, and uh, uh, including priests who don't, diocesan priests who don't make a vow but make a promise. And what can happen, as you may know, with priests, is we can be very minimalistic. Well, technically, it means that I got to go to whatever parish the archbishop sends me, you know? I mean, some priests have reduced obedience to that, okay? Like, the archbishop assigns me. Otherwise, don't you tell me anything about what I'm supposed to do, you know? And, of course, guess what? Surprise, surprise, it's now gotten worse than that. Now you have priests who connive with the priest's assignments board and try to find their friend on the board and make sure I don't go to that parish, but I go to this parish and so forth. It's corrupt. The assignment of priests to parishes can be corrupt including the fact if you have a parish with someone who's not sexually living in the right place, surprise, surprise, those priests try to find another person who's not living that way to replace them at that parish. How is it that their parishes often stay bad? Because of the corruption of the priest's assignment board. And I can tell you more stories about that. When I was uh, ending my 11 years at the seminary, you all know, they literally have these meetings, they sit down with me, Father Bear, where do you want to go? And I said, I take obedience very seriously. I am not even going to recommend any particular place. And they offered me a place. At a certain point, they offered me Epiphany in Coon Rapids. They offered me St. Olaf's in downtown Minneapolis. They offered campus ministry over the year. I said, I believe in obedience. And part of the course, the reason I believe in that is because, you know, 
If I have a bad time at Transfiguration, I better not say, well, this is the place I tried to get. <laughs> oh, right? I had nothing to do with Transfiguration. It was totally a surprise when I got the word that Thursday night from the Archbishop. Praise God, because I believe in obedience. But what's interesting is how much Pope John Paul said about obedience for married people, for other people in other states of life. For example, he says that, uh, you know, parents, sorry, I can call them, parents have obedience to their children. Now, that doesn't mean you do whatever your children want. It doesn't mean you, you know, acquiesce to their every will. What it means is you are obligated in a whole variety of ways to your children. You don't get up in the morning like bachelors and say, I'm just going to live my lifestyle. I want to do what I want to do with my vacations and so forth. You know, and maybe I'll be able to send my kids to Catholic school, maybe I won't, maybe I'll be able to do this, maybe I won't. Parents even have an obligation of obedience to their children. The Pope said, I have an obedience to you. Isn't that great? You all should say, whoa, can we get this down? Can we turn the tape recorder on, make sure we get that? I have an obedience to you. As your pastor, as your spiritual father, I am obligated to do certain things for you. Now, once again, uh, some people would laugh at that because it means they think it means that someone in the parish can snap their fingers. I demand this, Father. I demand this, and so forth. That's not what it's saying. In fact, the most important thing I have obedience towards you is I am required to celebrate the sacraments. And I am obligated to celebrate the sacraments frequently. I am obligated to celebrate the sacraments according to the church's teaching about how they're to be done. I am not a free bird. I'm not free to go and say, well, I've always preferred to do Mass this way or that way. I don't like that prayer. I'm going to drop it. I have an obedience to you, not just upwards towards the Pope and the teaching. I have an obedience to you to celebrate the sacraments the way the Church says to. Not adding, not subtracting, not changing. And whoa, did we get into trouble as a Church by priests thinking they weren't having to be obedient to that teaching. We've gotten into so much trouble. Now people change parishes. They jump from parish A to parish B to parish C. Why? Because priests decided that at this parish, we're not going to obey the church's teaching. Over this parish, we're going to change this or that. Look at the trouble. We now have a supermarket of parishes. Hmm, which one do I prefer? That is awful. And look at what the trouble it is to get back. You, you, by the way, you talk to anybody from any parish, that had, you know, so-called general absolution and confessions. You know, you all sit in a big church and you write a slip of paper and then you burn them in some fire. I mean, you know. You talk to the priest that had to come in after that nonsense and get it back to the normal thing. If they were doing that for 10 years, it takes 10 years to get the parish back because priests were not obedient. Priests are meant to be obedient above and below in every other way. And look at the damage. But of course... What do we think marriage vows are? I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad. Right there in that vow, if you look closely, you see poverty. I'm giving away my life. I'm not just going to give half, you know, that old joke. Marriage isn't 50-50. It's 100-100%. It's poverty. It is chastity. It says, I'm not just going to engage in sexual activities with you to please me, but thank goodness we now have a marriage license. So anything goes because, you know, we're doing it sort of as married people. No. That's what, in fact, Pope John Paul got in trouble for saying. A married person, a married couple, is not free to engage in every possible form of expression. And again, we won't go into it here. No. Because much of that is basically, I have sexual needs and pleasures that I wish to have, and she better give them to me. And of course, sadly, now we've taken the next step where now you don't need a real wife. Now you can go on the computer to find your needs met. And trust me, as a pastor in the confessional, the damage that those things have done to marriages, because don't tell me the other partner isn't aware that what's going on here is not a mutual giving, but it's a taking. And I'm going to draw my perverse imagination from all these other sources and it's going to go right into the middle of that marriage. And the wife, in some cases the husband, the wife can tell that all of these fantasies are going on. It is ruining marriages all around us. Poverty, chastity, 
and obedience. When I get married to someone, I take away my claim that I can live the way I've always lived. I now live in obedience. And as I've said before, a diocesan parish priest, a pastor, is not a bachelor. Although you look at my kitchen, you might guess so. <laughs> a parish priest is married. He is married to his people. And I must exercise towards you the same qualities of a married person. Fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, attentiveness. A priest must be all those things to his bride because he is standing in persona Christi caput, in the person of Christ the head. And I have a bride like Christ has a bride, and I will be judged. More strictly, St. James says, if that's any comfort to you, <laughs> I hope Father Bear gets judged. He will get judged very badly in heaven, especially if I have not been as Christ to his bride, the church. Let's go back for now for a second and talk about what does it mean for each of us, according to our various states of life, to be called to holiness. Well, the first thing is this. The first thing is this, is that we as Catholics need to get back to realizing how big baptism is. And we need to have things that, that celebrate that, that help us to remember that. You know, I'm so glad we're having lots of baptisms again here at Transfiguration. If, among other reasons, it's because lots of grown-ups like us get to watch again and again and listen again and again to the prayers of the little baby being baptized. You know, people are fine to get baptized in the afternoon or separately, that's fine. But they're also free to get married here at the church. And one of the things I hope all of us do is to recall that baptism that we experience. You know, I said this to our school children. I said, I want all of you as your assignment to go back and find what day you were baptized. You should know, because they all know their birthdays. I say, you better learn your spiritual birthday. And as many of you know, there are other parts of the world where your baptism day is a bigger hoop de doo than your natural birthday. More present, and then, boy, the kid's like, what, 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 what? <laughs> Can you tell us that? I said, yes. For many parts of the world, there's more candles, more cake, more gifts on your baptism date. And boy, they rushed home and tried to find out what their baptism date was. They went back to their baby books and we were getting calls here at Martha at the desk, you know, could you please look up my daughter's baptism somewhere back in the summer of 1996 and so forth, you know? And that's good. And we really should make more of a deal. You know, we're going to talk next week about a number of things, including what some people call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But not just with what's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but with many groups here, with many of their acts of consecration, whether according to St. Louis de Montfort or others. If you read closely what's going on in those acts of consecration, what they are is a renewal, a coming alive of what's objectively there in baptism. You know, if we just did what we said we believe happens at baptism, we'd be in a very, very good place. We wouldn't have to add all sorts of icing to the cake and fireworks and candles. Baptism takes you from death to life. Baptism takes you from the power of the devil to the power of the Holy Spirit. Baptism takes you from being alone, horribly alone in every sense, to being joined to God's people, joined to the church, joined to the family of God, and so forth. Do we act like that? Do we make anything of a deal about what baptism is? You know, I've, I've got Baptist friends, you know. And uh, a lot of them take it a lot more seriously than we do. You know, I remember when I went down to the South to study, boy, I used to love to go to baptism as the Baptist churches, you know? Because, you know, if you've ever been to one, you know, it's cool. You know, at the front, instead of having a crucifix and an altar, they've got the big font, you know? It's kind of cheesy the first time you see it. Usually there's some sort of stained glass window of Jesus being baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. And then for the event, you know, the cheesy window gets pulled away, and there you have even cheesier is a big tub, a big pool. You can see the chlorinated water up there. And they have microphones, so you can hear swish, 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 and so forth. And then here comes, here comes the pastor, you know, again, with sort of a, you know, white robe on. And here comes the person to be baptized, you know, again, with some sort of white robe on, you know? So this is cool, you know? So you hear the swish and so forth, and the microphones and all. And then, of course, what they do is, uh, what they do for the baptism is they take a handkerchief, put it over their mouth and nose, and then they lean them backwards into the water, and so forth. And even they take all these precautions, you know, the adult invariably comes up choking and spitting and coughing. It's kind of a royal mess. But the whole crowd gets very excited and starts laughing, you know, clapping. If they're Pentecostal, they speak in tongues and so forth. Anyway, it's a big hoop-de-doo. 
I know, you know, I can sit there as a Catholic and go, hmm, no. But I gotta say, I look around and I see enthusiasm, even though they don't believe half of what we believe as Catholics actually happens at baptism. You know, they just believe it's just a, like a symbol. No. And yet they're excited about it. We need to have a culture of transfiguration that says, if there's a baptism, I'll be darned if I'm just going to walk out of church and not go over to that family and say to that family, congratulations, I'm so excited that your baby just got baptized. Do anybody do that? Nah, i got to get home and get the pot roast corns on. Yeah, that little baby just went from being, to all due respect, a child of Satan to a child of God. Went from death to life, hell to heaven. You know? Just imagine what I said. I wish to announce before we end tonight that uh, uh, Judy back there, she just won the $32 million lottery. Hey, way to go, Judy. Okay, the Lord be with you. Yep. No. You look around. <laughs> Where's Judy? You know? You'd expect to see someone with a certain kind of smile, a certain kind of something, you know? You know? And you might want to say, I want to meet Judy, you know? <laughs> well, we believe that baptism is only a billion times bigger than winning the lottery. But we get so casual about it. Do you send your children and grandchildren cards on their baptism anniversaries? Do you tell them how wonderful it is that they're a child of God? Because the most you want for them is to be with them in heaven. The most important thing you say to them is not that you get into a good high school, not that you find a good job. The most important thing, my dear, is that you be with us as family forever in heaven. And on this, the day of your baptism, I rejoice, I thank God that you've been baptized. I tell you what, you could do a lot worse things than send your children and grandchildren a baptism. And even if they've left the faith, I know, I know fallen away young Catholics who've come back because of notes like that. They thought, what? What? And what is often the first good question to get them back to the faith. What is this? The grandmother is so excited about my baptism. Now, Let's talk about individual vocations, and this is a source of some confusion. We all know the word vocation, vocal, comes from the word for call. It's, a, it's an audio thing. We've heard the Lord call us by name. So at a certain point, vocation became identified with certain particular things. But let's remember, again, that the church itself talks about the universal vocation. Calling vocation is exactly the same thing. The universal vocation to holiness. So every one of us has been called, every one of us has a vocation. Now here's what happened. At a certain point in the church's history, vocation was associated with like priests and nuns. You know, that's still the case many times. If you see a vocations poster on the wall, you're not going to see married couples typically, all right? You typically see people preparing for priesthood, people preparing for nuns and so forth. Then people say, well, we've got to be careful here because otherwise it looks like there's first-class citizens and second-class citizens in the church. So at a certain point you say, well, vocations aren't just to being a priest or a monk or religious, a sister or brother and so forth. Married people have a calling and so forth. So that became popular. Then when you had the renewal of the order of the permanent diaconate, let's not forget deacons, okay? So always have deacons tacked on at the end. Okay. And then you had a whole bunch of people go on, um, am I chopped liver? You know, <laughs> I'm a single person. I don't fit in any of those categories, so I'm just like not called, am I just like nothing and so forth? Then you start to have, again, single people are added to those lists, okay? We pray for the vocations of, and single people get added. Then people start to say, well, I, I didn't quite hear widow, you know? Um, I, get, I am single, but I single in a very special way, make sure we have the widows there. How about separated, uh, separated even a divorce? You know, I'll, I'll, you know, so before long, you know, you, you got this whole thing, you know? Reminds me of a certain more recent phenomenon where everybody's got to add letters to a certain category of people's sexual activities and so forth. All right, so let's get back to this and get a little bit of common sense here. All right, everyone, everyone who's baptized has a vocation, all right? So let's talk at these others and see what we really mean by this. What is, for example, vocationally speaking, a priest? Well, again, we could go through a lot to say more about this. But basically, there is a relationship, I hope we know this, there's a relationship between the priesthood of an ordained priest like me 
and the universal priesthood that the church teaches every one of you has. For you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And the church teaches that, has always taught it, even though it's more popularly spoken about these days. Now, enter a lot of politics, you know, as you probably know. A lot of politics over the last 50 years. Who can be priests? Who can't be an ordained priest? And da 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 da. You know, Susie Q says, I feel called by God to be a priest. It's only the church keeping me in a bond. But the church does teach that every one of us has that call to be a priest according to sharing in the priesthood of Jesus Christ through baptism. That priesthood has three elements to it. Sometimes called priest, prophet, and king. And sometimes those are expressed differently. Like king is sometimes softened down to be like shepherd and pastor and so forth. That's fine, okay? But often this is understood to be the threefold, threefold identity of Christ. And again, priestly, of course, especially associated with sacrifice and sacrament. Again, <coughs> prophet being teaching and proclaiming God's word, God's truth and king being shepherding, guiding, pastoring others, and so forth. So what we do say as Catholics is, every Catholic by baptism, just as every Catholic should look for the evangelical councils in their lives, every Catholic should look to these ministries somehow at work in them. And again, let's use priest. We all know what a priest is. Above all, he's his intercessor. He connects God with man and man with God. And for goodness sake, if only young parents today would realize that, that they are meant to bring their children to God and God to their children. You know, they've just done studies. And the single biggest thing, second only to coming to Mass, how do parents keep their children in the faith, is if they communicate with their children how important their faith is to themselves. Do children ever hear their parents saying, I love being a Catholic. Going to Mass is very important. I pray. When you go to bed at night, I take a minute to pray. Do they ever hear that? If they do, the huge likelihood of them themselves staying Catholic. Once again, we could give talks on how parents, on every one of us, single, whatever, can exercise this. Now again, because of the politics of the last 50 years, the church has had to make clear what it's always taught, which is there is a substantial difference, not just a, a sort of a gradual difference between an ordained priest and everybody else. It's not like you all are priests and then I get a little bit of pixie dust spread on me and now I'm sort of super priest. Da -da -da, I get to wear the collar and so forth, all right? What the church teaches is there is an actual change of nature or of being in a priest. And, oh, do some people hate that. <gasps> there are people who, I just a month ago, a, a local bulletin mocked the idea that a priest is ontologically, ontos means being or substance, that a, a priest is ontologically different than a non-priest. And, and so it's out there now, you know? Uh, yes, it's liberal. Did I just say that on the tape? Yes. Liberal notions of priesthood have tried to tear down the distinctiveness of what the ordained priesthood is all about. And you can see it, you know? Let's not have any titles. You know, just call a priest by his first name. Let's, for goodness sake, not wear anything distinctive. Let's not have him up there. And again, sometimes it reaches comical levels, you know? When uh, St. Beck Thomas Beckett's church was first built down in Egan, one of the most striking things was the priest chair, it was just stuck in the second row of the congregation, you know? And of course, it was like, so the priest goes up and leads, then he comes down, sits down in the second row, the priest goes up, you know, because we don't want the priest to be seen as somebody special or different and so forth, all right? If you think that's nonsense, here's Jesus calling. <laughs> if you think that's nonsense, when I first got here to Transfiguration, one of the you know, many things that struck me was they would have people brought up the gifts, go up the three or four steps to hand the gifts off, at the uh, offertory. The problem was some of those people are elderly, some can't walk so well, and I thought, this is curious. You'd think that they'd want, again, to be very you know, careful that people with disabilities weren't limited. Oh, silly you. You're missing the ideological point. We don't want in any way for it to appear that the sanctuary is only for the priests. So even if the poor person is on crutches, we make them go up those four steps to make sure that it's not seen as a restricted area up there. In fact, one of the things you'll notice was in many churches, they stopped using the word sanctuary to describe that section up there. Now the whole place becomes the sanctuary. Of course, more to the point, they get rid of it entirely. You know, just call it all the worship space and so forth, you know? Uh, 
The ultimate evil was to have anything distinct for the priests. Uh, this is a big reason why people got rid of altar rails. It's a big reason why I'm bringing one back next year. Is because, is because there's an ideology underneath all this. You know, why are people so allergic to altar rails? Why are people so allergic to priests being called, you know, as soon as I go up now to these days, a certain generation, you know, you can guess who they are, a certain generation. Hi, my name is Father Bill Bear. Oh, hi, Bill. You know? You know? Who gave you the permission to call me Bill? It's a whole culture out there. Because we must flatten this out. We must make sure that priests aren't anybody. And again, you know, nine out of ten things that people got ticked off about me here at the parish were about how dare I do this or that. How dare I make the decisions about how Mass is done? Don't you know that's the liturgy coordinator? You know? And if you don't believe that, I can hear this out to you. This is from the archives here. This is given out by the previous liturgy coordinators and so forth, called Top Ten Myths About Lay Ministry. It was meant to sort of, you know, make fun of this idea that priests are somehow in a particular role. But look at this, you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, lay people are no good, basically. The clergy are holier. In other words, they're trying to say, look at all these awful things people used to believe, and thank God we don't believe anymore. Look at this. I'm not making this stuff up. All right? So, so we had a whole culture of that, you know? A whole culture. And unfortunately, I know that most priests want to please people. Again, by nature, they're nice people. And that's the worst thing in the world for a priest. Worst thing, to be nice, okay? You might think it's the best thing. It is... No, it's, it's like having an alcoholic work at the distillery and so forth, okay? If you're already, if you're already disposed to being pushed around by whoever can play with your emotions, and there's no place of passive-aggressive emotional stuff like a church world, parish world. The manipulation is everywhere, you know? I told you, my first, my first day here, July 1st, 2010, one of the leading staff comes in, you know, and says, uh, you know, what's going to be your policy on giving you know, non-wheat host to people because of the gluten issue and so forth, you know? I said, well, I do, <laughs> I do what the church says. The church says you can give a very low gluten host to someone. You may also allow them just to partake from the chalice, you know, and make temporary precautions, but you can't go serving rice hosts and so forth. <sighs> <laughs> it's clear that you're not a parent because if you were a parent, you would think differently about that. This is at practically 10.30, my first day on the job, okay? <laughs> Passive, aggressive, emotional manipulation, all right? If you are a Christian, if you are a good Christian, you know, you would allow them to have the rice host and so forth, okay? This happens all the time. A week ago, yes, Justin, if you don't believe it, a week ago, I got a nasty letter, I won't go into the details. It had to do with something that happened recently here in the parish. And this angry person, ex christian just left, says, you know, you may teach Christianity here, but it's clear you don't live it, and so forth, all right? It had to do with the fact that uh, we held someone accountable, you know? And so the whole church world is filled with this whole ideology that's trying to go after this. Well, again, I could amuse you with more stories, but I won't. But what priesthood is, and here's a key thing, because it'll help us especially understand that marriage as well. Priesthood is an intensification and the specification of the universal call of holiness. How is my priesthood different than yours? Obviously, I, was, I, I received the sacrament of holy orders, all the wonderful things that go on with that, with the ontological, unchanging nature of my priesthood and so forth. But the reason why I say this is because this is helpful for every authentic vocation or state of life. What you see is an intensification of what all of us are called to by baptism. And a specification, I have a particular role, if you want to call it that, a particular munis, these things are called ministries, the word ministry comes from munis, a particular role that's different than what you all have. It's an intensification of that. You know, once again, all you have to do is look back over the past 50 years. Why can't we have a lay person give the homily? Because many times they're better teachers than the priest. True. Many times their, their, their teaching has more impact. Fine enough, okay? But you see what's happening there. It's to take the universal call for all of us to share, to evangelize, to teach our children, etc. It's saying, let's just squash that. Or, of course, it got more radical. Certain parishes in town, you had laid people up there standing next to the priest. This is my body, and, and they're standing there with some quasi-vestments on and so forth, all right? Again, we all have a priesthood in Christ. 
But what happens is these things start to get watered down. And then before long, it's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. So it's an intensification and a specification. But let's take this now to marriage and look at the same question. All right? Are we all called to be married? Well, the answer is no. But it is worth noting, again, that married people, their married life, their married love, all of their commitments are rooted in the universal call to holiness. That's why I sometimes chuckle and say, you know, some people think there's only like three or four Bible passages about marriage. Like, no. Everything in the Bible is for married people. <laughs> you know? I say that to my seminarians, you know? I say, you know, you get holy and then you'll be a priest, all right? You can. To love one another, lay down your lives for one another, serve one another, be faithful to one another, pray together. All these things, they're not just for married people, but they are the foundation for married life. And what happens with the vows of marriage is there is an intensification and a specification. There's definitely an intensification. What I now owe my spouse, I sort of owe to every other Catholic and Christian, but now in a very intense way I owe my spouse. In fact, that's not, that's not bad to make an editorial comment. One of the worst danger signs is to see a parish where all sorts of married people are spending too much time around the parish. <laughs> not a good sign. Yes, I hope a lot of them spend some time. But again... There's some people who treat the parish like they should be treating their spouse. And nine times out of ten, there's something wrong at home. And now they're here at church. And trust me, as a priest, you start to spot that, you know. Why do I never see your spouse at all? And so forth, you know. Uh, what's going on there? So, there's a way that a married person gives up. I know a lot of young married people now. They were active in, well, they might have been seminarians. They might have been active in net ministries. They might have gone to a thousand retreats a weekend and so forth. There's people call retreat hogs. They need more retreats and so forth. Okay, fine. Listen, you get married. You got to lay some of that down now. Wow, wow. I love these things. Sorry. Okay, okay. There's an intensification and specification directed towards your beautiful spouse. And it should feel different. It should feel different and so forth. Now, the last thing I want to talk about here, we've talked about the universal call to holiness. We've talked about how that comes through baptism. We've talked about how it's expressed according to different states of life. And as I say, if a, pers a person is never just single, you know, this is the big granddaddy of all vocations. It's not being a priest, okay? You know, oh, Father, it must have been the biggest day of your life when you were ordained. Well, it sort of was, because as you know, I was ordained on my birthday, so I got the biggest birthday of all, May 25th, you yeah. know? But, uh, uh, but no, the biggest day of my life was my baptism. And every true Catholic better agree with that. I know your wedding day was special, and blah, 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 blah. Your baptism was bigger. Your baptism was bigger. One day, you might not be married anymore. If your spouse should pass away and so forth, but you will always be baptized. And even me as a priest, I am a priest forever. But what I received, again, was based on something even bigger that happened to me when I was baptized. The last thing I want to say to us is this, is that the purpose of this whole seminar, these eight weeks, is not just to learn a few interesting things, I hope, about the sacraments and so forth. It's to help the sacraments that are in us already to come alive and for the Holy Spirit to energize and make deeper and more real those sacraments. And what we're going to be doing in these next two weeks, week seven, week eight, essentially, is we're going to be talking about that very, very concretely. Let me give you a little coming attraction to next week. Next week, we're going to talk about consecration. Consecration. It's a, it's a fancy word. It basically means to be set apart in some sort of particular way, especially for God, for holiness. But one of the things we're going to talk about is the fact, and I'll go through it, you might find it interesting. The fact that every spiritual movement, I don't care whether it's the Carmelites or it's other religious orders, whether it's the 33 days of morning glory, whether it's the Life of the Spirit seminars, whether it's the Alpha Course, whether it's the Jesuit Ignatian exercises, every one, interesting, every one of those things leads a person to a moment a moment that you might call consecration, you might call dedication, you might call, again, the kind of moment of decision. And I want to talk about that because that's very important. It's deep in our Catholic tradition. I want to talk about why it's important and I want to talk about why we here at the parish, and not just over there with Emmaus, 
and not just over there with couples for Christ, and not just over there with the Third Order Carmelites, but why we all, all Catholics, need to have moments of consecration. Why they bring authentic spiritual power into their lives as the sacraments. And I think you're going to find this interesting. Again, I've been around a few years. I've been around part of many movements. Again, I could tell you stories that would make you chuckle. You know? But I have seen over and over again that the deep Catholic instinct is Jesus saying to the rich young man, put all your stuff down, come and follow me. And how valuable it is to be able to look back to those moments and say, that really touched and changed my life. Again, I think sometimes people make fun of these things. Either they see them as some emotional high. You know, sometimes that young people go off to a retreat and they have a powerful experience. They come back all excited and the parents are sitting there like, yeah, this will last about a day and a half. Well, stop that. Don't talk that way. Because that young person who went off to that tech retreat or wherever they went, they perhaps were touched in a way that for centuries people have been touched by entering into not just religious life, but beautiful apostolates, the Third Order Carmelites, all these wonderful moments. And the fact is, the fact is, when I look around now at, say, young Catholics who are fired up for their faith, living strong, they may not tell me initially, but if I dig a little deeper, I find out that those good Catholics, and we all want more of them, they look back at a moment whether it was being baptized in the Spirit or consecrated their lives to our Lord through the Blessed Mother according to Louis de Montfort or a hundred other ways. Over and over again there is consecration. And part of the reason I'm saying that is that it's valuable for all of us. Valuable for all of us. Again, there's many different expressions to it. And what's happening at the end of this eight-week conference isn't just, okay, take the leftover donuts home. But we want to make sure there is an opportunity for us to have that. Now, just again, to telegraph ahead of time, we're not going to be doing that during the session itself because it really needs to be voluntary. And uh, there's a lot of social pressure to get put on by groups. I thought I was signing up for a course. Now you're laying hands on me saying, you know, she came in a Honda, she came in a Honda, and so forth. Now, I'm not going to do that kind of thing, okay? But I'm going to talk about this. And I'm going to talk about the typical threefold ways people have always prepared for consecration. The first, of course, is the sacrament of penance and a certain kind of confession. You know, whether you call it a sort of more general confession of your whole life, but we're going to talk about that. Because many of us are overdue to make something of a major general confession in preparation for what God wants us to do. The second thing, the second thing is certain kinds of fasting. It's no accident that church fasts before Easter and used to fast before Christmas and fast before anything important. Before these great holy days, you have a fast. It brings your life into that. And whether the fasting is a food or other things, we're going to talk about that. But fasting is so essential to unlocking the power of the sacraments. So we talk about confession, we talk about fasting, and we talk also about you making it personal and making it real. Again, we're going to talk about the value of someone. You know, when people became priests in the old days, you had to write a letter to the archbishop. You still do. You still have to request holy orders from the archbishop. But what used to be was a very deep, profound spiritual testament. A, a, a priest, someone waiting to get ordained, had to write down and say, Archbishop, here is what I understand this to be. Here is what I hope to be as a priest. Here is the calling of God in my soul and so forth. And the, uh, the bishop would look at that. You know? And he was a good bishop. He'd meet with these people. And say, so you say here that uh, you hope to get a good parish in the suburbs where you have your own heated garage. And so, okay, yeah. <laughs> you should look at these sorts of things, all right? Well, that's, uh, that's also true, I know, of some married couples in which they do that. It's beautiful. Before they get married, they write to their beloved. And they say, I hope you put this someplace. And I hope we can open it up in 20 years and see that I've been true to these promises that I expressed to you. Well, we're going to talk about these three things. The importance of confession the importance of fasting and preparation, the importance of making it personal and making it real through some sort of personal declaration. I really believe that the sacraments are to come alive here in Transfiguration. And it happens soul by soul by soul by soul. And we're going to talk next week about the nature of consecration and those elements that really help it to happen. Once again, thanks for joining us this week. God bless you, and we hope to see you next week.
We might have time for a couple questions or comments if there's any. Any comments from married people? Well, uh, let me say this about that problem. <laughs> I see it. Yes, please. I was wondering, like, when you hear of parishes that don't have regular meat brought to this parish, is, is like the, the archdiocese to help these parishes have priests that are obedient? Well, it's a good question. I mean, as I've said before, the most important thing is to raise up good new priests. Uh, there's they are right there. Go pray for them. Don't ever walk past that poster without picking one out, Charlie or Jimmy or Joey, <laughs> and saying a Hail Mary for them, okay? Please notice there's no one from Transfiguration there. There's been no one from Transfiguration for decades. We've had some deacons, we've had some religious sisters, praise God, and so forth. There are parishes, and I'm not just talking about the famous ones. St. Agnes! Oh, I love St. Agnes, by the way. We should do what they're doing, all right? And stop making fun of St. Agnes and get some more priests from Transfiguration. But take a look, there's about six or seven that have multiple locations from there. Why aren't they coming from this? Because you follow him. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Always willing to blame the last four priests, okay? Because they were here too, all right? Okay? <laughs> so we're talking about it. There's reasons for it. There's reasons for it. This place has had a real spirit of opposition to the clergy in many respects. Trust me. It's been deep, and people all over town know about it. When I got sent here, they said, oh, you better get ready for people to say we don't like priests over their transfiguration and so forth. Anyway, that's another topic. But you go past there and pray because they are the ones that are going to make the difference. It's hard to teach an old dog your tricks. St. Alphonsus de Liguori said that. He said it very soberly. You know, St. Alphonsus said, it's very rare that a priest goes wrong and then comes back. Maybe, he said, if it's in terms of like uh, sins of the flesh and so forth. Thank God if a, if a priest can acknowledge his issues with, with sexuality, with alcohol and so forth. And so on. Even then they need great, great care. But he said, it's very rare that a priest ever stand up and say, for 25 years I taught what wasn't true and now I'm sorry for doing that. And St. Alphonse said, the reason for it is, is it because it tucks into pride. It is really humbling. It's, it, it's, hard. it's even more humbling than for a priest to say, I got sins of the flesh, than for a priest to stand up and say, I really sort of left behind the truths of the faith and now I want to come back. He said, it can happen. Of course, grace is always possible. But you go back and count how many priests you know who ever did that. And it's even worse with nuns. Many times nuns who would be giving up, because no one lives all in nuns, as I say. Yeah. Supreme Court justices and nuns live forever, okay? So, <laughs> but even at the age of 92 or 101, these nuns, if they've gone off, they almost never come back because it requires humility. So, frankly, in the real world, pray for the new priests, the young priests, uh, who haven't gotten corrupted uh, because they're going to be the ones that are going to do it. So, that's a good question. Yes, Justin? Do you have book suggestions for um, diving into the theology of the body, say Christopher West or whatever? It's a good question. If you didn't hear, I mentioned the fact that Pope John Paul's beautiful, extraordinary teaching on marriage, family, sexuality uh, was often uh, encapsulated in books or, or topics called the theology of the body. The difficulty with that is I think some are better than others. Some of them, in fact, are trying so hard to say, hey, sex is cool, just do it the Catholic way. Cool, cool, cool. And that sounds good, but before long, you're getting a little weird with that. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, God meant for us to approach the area of sexuality with a certain modesty. And I think some Catholics think it's really fine to talk about it every level, anywhere, anyhow, so long as you're teaching, I don't know, Catholic truth about it. I think there should be some restraint, even among good Orthodox Catholics. You've seen this, including the sex education of children and so forth. So what I recommend are some of the earlier writings about this, going back to now Bishop John Lavoir. Bishop Lavoir was Father Lavoir for many years at St. Charles Borromeo Parish. And uh, he was one of the first people in America to do very careful uh, you know, collections of the teachings of Pope John Paul II on this. And so anything you see with Father Lavoir's title above it, anything you see with uh, Dr. Uh, Doug Bushman's teaching about it are excellent. I would stay away from Christopher West and some of those other people. So it's a little too sensationalistic. Thank you. Well, thank you again so much, and we look forward to seeing you. And thank you to Emmaus, and I don't, don't think you'll mind if you take a few leftovers with him home for a moment.